Hello, welcome to a new video. It's Legend of Thon. Um, it is Friday the 9th of December. Legend of Thon started at midnight. I was asleep at midnight because I have been an ill bear. But I'm very, very excited to do some reading this week and I'm going to take you along with me this week and we'll, we'll see what we can get read from this pile of books. I am not going to talk to you about these now um, because I've already filmed a TBR video where I'm talking about them um, and then in this video you're going to hopefully hear me reading, not hear me reading them, this is not an audiobook experience, um, you're going to be along with me as I'm reading them so you'll find out what they're about as, as I'm reading them and I'm hoping that I'll be able to get to most if not all of them. Um, but if you want to know about them you can watch watch my TBR video. I'm not quite sure why you'd pause this video now and go and watch my TBR, but I'll link it down below. If you are a person who is particularly process driven and wants to watch the TBR before watching the actual reading experience, knock yourself out. There you go. Um, but very, very quickly, we have got The Penelope Ad by Margaret Atwood. An, ep uh, an episode, <laughs> an edition of Cunning Folk, um, which is the Earth issue. The Moon Riders by Teresa Tomlinson, The Beginning of the World in the Middle of the Night by Jen Campbell, and The Gilded Ones by Namna Fauna. And I have just started this morning, finally, The Song of Achilles by Madeline Miller. I was, I started with this one because it was the one that I was most anxious about. Anxious about, it's a bloody book, get a grip. Um, not anxious, but uh, it was the one that was the most hyped in my head, and also the one that I think is going to give me the biggest feels. Um, so yeah, I've started with this one. I'm enjoying it so far. It's it's the same uh, super readable, engaging writing style that um, I recognised from Circe uh, by the same author, which I really liked. Um, I didn't know at what point this was going to pick up and it has picked up sort of like kind of right at the start of Patroclus's life and I didn't know that it was told from Patroclus's perspective, which makes me interested as to at what point this book will finish. No spoilers, but um, yeah, or if it switches perspectives partway through, um, I will let you know. So my plan for this week is I think, other than this quick hello, I'm gonna just crack on with my reading and maybe check in with you in the evening every day and just let you know a little bit about what I've been, what I've been reading. Um, I would love to know uh, if you're picking up any myth retellings. Ooh, she's done it again. Sorry for kicking you. Um, if, you've, if you're picking up any myth retellings this week, uh, I would love to know what they are, if you've got any recommendations, if you've read anything and loved it, if you've read something else by any of these authors, um, any of that, just chuck the recommendations my way. I'd love to, I'd love to hear from you. So let's do this thing. Hi, uh, it is five to ten on Friday evening. Um, I have read a hundred pages of Song of Achilles so far. I'm really enjoying it. I have, but anyway, beside the point, I'm really, really, really enjoying it. Um, I just. I'm having the same feeling though that I had with Natalie, Natalie Haynes's Stone Blind, which I talked about in my November wrap up, which is I love myth retellings, but the problem I have with myth retellings is that when it's a retelling of a story that I know well, like Achilles' story, you just, you know what's going to happen. And at the moment, they're they're 16 year old boys, Achilles and Patroclus, and they've sort of just getting to understand their feelings for each other and feel secure and comfortable together and it's beautiful and tender and lovely and you just, you just know what's gonna happen. And I'm really struggling. <laughs> and I know that's the gig, like I, I knew before I picked it up that that is what was gonna happen, but it really does, yeah, um, 
it really does gut you. I'm like, I'm like pre-gutted is, is how I feel at the moment. Um, but in terms of the, the, the book, I'm, I'm enjoying it. I, I wasn't sure when it started so early on, um, basically like pretty much with Patroclus's birth, I was a bit worried because it's not that big of a book and we got a lot of stuff has to happen kind of in their later lives. Um, I was a bit worried about how the pacing would feel, but I actually think the way she's built their relationship up over the first sort of, what is this, third of the book? Um, <laughs> please don't be distracted by Lewin just trying to get the right corner of his pillow to suckle. He self-soothes. Um, I feel like I need to self-soothe in advance of finishing reading this book. But, um, yeah, I actually think, I think the plotting of their relationship does work, but I, I am a bit, um, in, and I'm, I'm no buff about, um, ancient Greek history, but, um, in every adaptation, uh, or version of this, this story that I have read, Patroclus is also a soldier. Um, yes, he's a he's a healer, but he is also a soldier, and he can also fight. And he's not presented like that in in this book. Madeline Miller has very much made him a lover, not a fighter, which I respect. But at the same time, it makes things that I know are going to happen in the future all the more like. Patroclus, no. Um, I, uh, oh god, I am. I've just got so many pre feelings about. It's it's why I've put reading this book off for so long. I think. I think I knew I would like it. I think I knew I would fall in love with them and their relationship, and then be gutted by what is definitely going to happen. Unless Madeline Miller has just been like the kind of mythry teller where she goes fuck it they all lived happily ever after but um something is making me think uh, based on everyone going like have tissues to hand i'm guessing she doesn't do that in this book but yeah it's 10 o'clock i think i'm gonna i'm gonna carry on reading it but um i thought i would check in now before uh i get too tired to film anything um I'll probably carry on with this, but I might also um, pick up maybe Cunning Folk or maybe Jen Campbell's short story collection to like mix it up a bit. But to be honest, it's it's so gripping and it's so engaging and I really, really want to keep reading it. But at the same time, I really don't want the things that have to happen to happen. <laughs> okay. See ya. This is what I'm talking about. This is what I'm talking about. They think they've... Did you... We know what's gonna happen. It's like I don't want to read anymore. In all of my concern about what is gonna happen to Patroclus and Achilles, fucking forgot about Iphigenia, didn't I? Fuck's sake. Just woe on woe on woe. I know, Lewin. Miserable. Yes, I did snort at King of the Isle of Salamis. Yes, I did. Morning. Um, it's Saturday morning. I've just got in from an accidental two-hour dog walk. I didn't check in with you yesterday because um, football happened. Um, but I, I, I did read a lot of a lot of the Song of Achilles. Um, and I, I didn't read anything else, so um, I just felt like I didn't have that much to say yesterday night. But um, I'm sitting down. Now I have 30 pages 
left. So, we know what's going to happen. Okay. Off I go. Hi. Um, I finished the Song of Achilles and this is the second video that I'm little clip that I'm filming about it because I feel like the first one was a bit too negative because here's the thing I really really liked the book I think Madeline Miller did a beautiful job of queering the narrative I think their relationship between Patroclus and Achilles was really really well drawn I just all you know all those feelings that I was having earlier as I was reading it that like feeling of being pre-gutted and being so like oh my god oh no I think that worked against me as some of those events started to transpire I think almost because I had I'd been so not wanting it to happen that when it happened it all, almost, I did, didn't, I didn't really get much of an emotional wallop from it. Obviously, it was, it's really sad. I don't, I don't even know if this counts as a spoiler, because, like, if you don't know the story of what happens to Achilles and Patroclus, I mean, I don't know what to tell you. It's been around since the Bronze Age, so I don't really think I'd be spoiling it for you. Um, but you have five seconds to skip ahead a few minutes if you don't want to hear one two three four five okay so after patroclus is killed it's almost like what happens is the plot has to continue because and i understand that because they're in um they're in a war so there's not just going to be these laments but it felt really fast and I felt like all of that dread that had been building throughout the book and that she'd done so masterfully throughout the book just didn't quite, it didn't quite come to a head. I thought this book was going to make me sob. I, there were moments in the build up where the thought of thinking about what was going to happen made me want to cry. But when it happened, I didn't want to cry. Now, it could just be because I knew too much and was expecting it too much. Maybe it's because I hyped it too much in my head. But I do think that the plot did trample over it a little bit. Like, the all of the things that needed to happen. I think Madeline Miller had an idea of where she wanted the full narrative to end. And I did really, really like how she ended it. I was worried with her having a first person narrative voice from Patroclus's perspective and knowing that Patroclus was going to die I was like before the kind of resolution of the episode I I was a bit worried but she did she did manage it well with how she did that in in the end I just thought that she we had this moment where Patroclus died and this point that she wanted us to get to for the final resolution of the book. And it felt like she just wanted to get there as quickly as possible. And, and we didn't really sit with that extreme grief that Achilles was feeling. I guess because he was acting his grief, not really like feeling it. But I think that is maybe something that works a bit better in a more visual medium. I, th I think... Um, I think in novels we need a little bit more time to really grieve with a character. I just it just felt a little bit rushed for me in it. It yeah, it didn't quite have the emotional hit that I was hoping for. But up and up until up until those things started happening, I loved the the way the character of Briseis was um Presented, I really liked the friendship between Patroclus and Briseis. I thought that worked really well. I did appreciate that um, Achilles was fully flawed. I think sometimes um, there can be tendencies to over-romanticise the characters, and I think sometimes, especially in query tellings, because 
the temptation is is to have a really positive beautiful queer story which theirs was but they were not they were not perfect people and I was worried at the start that Achilles was being very sympathetically portrayed for what ends up happening and I think she did a really good job of developing his character to the point where it's believable but also disappointing not not in the writing but as a reader you are disappointed in Achilles as as you should be and I think she managed that really well um but yeah so so that was my first book my first book done um I did really really like it I having decided to refilm this bit because I was too negative before I think I've still been quite negative but I I think again this is this is to do with my feelings coming into this book how much I really wanted to love it and and how overly prepared I was for being devastated and I think if this book didn't have the reputation for being such a tearjerker I wouldn't have known I think the the books that I have really sobbed over this year have been ones where I didn't know that that's what the book was going to make me do so maybe it is is more about um my expectations then kind of getting in the way of of properly engaging with it but I think she's a great writer I do think I preferred Cersei um but I think that's because I don't know the story of Cersei so I couldn't do this to myself it's 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 hard liking with retellings you know because it's so hard to not spoil it for myself I think I'm going to pick up Cunning Folk next. The, um, ooh, where are we? This publication. And just read a few little bits and pieces from this before I pick which novel I'm going to read next. I also watched the first Lord of the Rings film yesterday, which I feel like is Myths and Legends vibes. Um, I like watching them around Christmas time. Uh, and I might, I might stick the two towers on later as well. Um, but yeah, so there we go. I will, uh, I will catch up with you when I've read some more. Oh, I have started listening to, um, Celtic Mythology by Philip Freeman. And this is Philip Freeman. I think it's Philip Freeman. And this was me. I'm listening to it on Scribd. Um, and because Scribd is like um, an unlimited sort of audiobook, ebook service, so you don't pay per title, I do play a bit fast and loose with what I listen to on Scribd, and I do not put a lot of care into thinking about whether or not I want to listen to something. I'm, I'm very impulsive with it, which is why I really like it as a as a um, as a platform. But I thought it was going to be a book of Celtic myths. And it's actually a non-fiction book, more about the history of the myths. And at the moment, it's quite dry. And it's, but I think he's just giving um, a sort of quick overview of some of the history behind Celtic mythology. And then I'm hoping we get into it a bit more. Otherwise, I might have to DNF that one because it's just not. I just wanted someone to tell me some nice Celtic myths. So if you know of a book that is that, that has Celtic myths in it, let me know because I would really, uh, I would really like that. So yeah. See you later. <coughs> Good start. <clears throat> Hi. It's Monday. I have just finished work. Um, and I thought I would check in with you. I haven't done tons of reading since the last time we spoke, but, um... I have made some decisions, so I think I said in the last clip that I'd started listening to um, Celtic Mythology by Philip Frieden, Frieden? Um, on audio. I I think I've decided to um, DNF that one. Nothing personal against the book, it's just not quite what I wanted. Um, it has got a bit better in terms of... Um, 
it's describing, it's sort of telling some of the stories, but it's just quite functional in the way that it tells the stories. And I'm like, if you're going to tell the stories, I want a bit of like narrative flair in there. If you know what I mean? Um, and it's just quite, um, it's just quite dry. It's just quite dry. Um, I, I wonder if I would appreciate it more as a hard copy book that I could kind of like flick through and read little bits and pieces, but on audio, it's, it's hard to do that. And I'm just not not massively enjoying it. So I think instead I am going to try um, Tales from Old Japan. I can't remember who the author is, but I'll, I'll be inserting it here. I think I'll try that one. A big part of me does just want to listen to Stephen Fry's Troy, but I've just read The Song of Achilles and I have another Troy retelling coming up later this week. So I think I think I should refrain and I'm gonna try the Tales of Old Japan and if that really doesn't work we're just gonna go back to Stephen Fry because we know he's gonna deliver. Um, so that's what I'm gonna do with the audio stuff and then I think this evening I am gonna pick up The Gilded Ones by Namina Fauna. So this... Now I don't know because I... Uh, I don't have a great um, knowledge of African myths. I think West African specifically these are this novel is based on but this is a YA novel um about I think there's like there are some girls who are born I think with gold blood and they are the gilded ones and that is what this book is about but you know I'll start reading it and then I'll tell you um I don't know how much I'll get done today because we did go and buy our Christmas tree, finally, um, earlier. We wanted to get it last week, but I was sick, um, so we couldn't get to the farm shop that we got our tree from. Um, but uh, she's downstairs right now. I'll insert some uh, footage, probably. She's a, she's a curvy girl, her name is Meredith. Um, and yeah, we're gonna be decorating that tonight and having kind of a bit of a Christmassy night, so I don't know if much reading will get done, but, um, I'll let you know if it does. And I did um, read a few articles from Cunning Folk. In particular, I really enjoyed um, Jen Campbell's poem, First Thing I Am a Forest. And the last article I read is by a writer called Christina Ferrandez, um, who I think is Spanish, yeah, um, is Spanish. And this was about... Um, it was a non-fiction piece which starts talking about um, Sarah Moss's Ghost Wall, which is a book that is on my TBR, it's on the shelf downstairs, um, which I knew nothing about except that lots of people had told me that I should try reading Sarah Moss because they think I will like her, um, and I think I will like her from what I know as well. But that book is about um, human sacrifice, but like specifically um, the bog sacrifices. So you know um, all of the different bog bodies that have come up through time and there is a lot of um, conjecture and experts tend to think that they are, uh, that they were sacrificed and that's how the bodies ended up in um, various peat bogs across, um, I was going to say across Europe. Is it just Europe? Are there peat bogs elsewhere? I think it's a European thing, but maybe, I don't know. Um, but this is sort of a non-fiction a, a non article that, um, it, it takes that as a starting point and then it's got a bit of history around um, bog sacrifices and then it kind of <laughs> leads into kind of a discussion on neo-paganism but I just I just really liked the way um, the way it was written so I've uh, they were the the two I think I've read about seven pieces in here and they were the two that I that I most enjoyed um, but yeah um, Really, really enjoying this. I think I might see if I can track down a copy of the air issue, but unfortunately, I don't have a copy of water or fire because there's, they've, they've done an elemental series. This is the, the fourth and final one, the earth issue. And I don't think they're gonna reprint them. <coughs> Coughing, sorry. That makes it sound like I'm like crying about them. Maybe they're not gonna reprint them. Let me cough. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it was Christmas jumper day at work, hence the uh, R2-D2 with the reindeer claws. Claws? Horns? Antlers? Jesus. Um, 
But yeah, I am. I'm really disappointed now. So if anyone has a copy of Fire or Water that they would not mind lending me, um, I would. I would really. I would really be interested in reading those as well. Um, but yeah. So Monday night. We're three days down. I'm feeling positive. I'm feeling positive. I didn't get much done yesterday because I did carry on watching the Lord of the Rings trilogy and watched The Two Towers and The Return of the King yesterday, which is just like a casual six hours out of my reading time. Um, but I enjoyed it, so I'm not going to beat myself up about it. These readathons are just a bit bloody fun, aren't they? So, yeah. If I don't read everything I wanted to, I will carry on reading it anyway. So, uh, yeah. Let us crack on, decorate the Christmas tree, and I will let you know. This this says, fans of Children of Blood and Bone and Black Panther are going to adore this. So, if you're a fan of either of those. I haven't read Children of um, Blood and Bone, but I liked, Bra I liked Black Panther. Sweet. Bye. Hi. It has been a little while. Um, it's now... Thursday night. Um, so Legendathon finishes tomorrow, I think at midnight tomorrow, and I've only finished my second book, which is a bit of a, a bit of a bummer. But um, let me tell you about it anyway. Um, this was The Gilded Ones by Namina Fauna. Um, it's a YA sort of fantasy that is loosely, I think, based on some Sierra Leone um, folklore legend but I'm not sure I've, I've, I've read an interview with Namana Fauna where she says she was inspired by legends from West Africa um, but I don't think it's like a direct retelling but um, I'm also not like super au fait with West African mythology so maybe it is um, so yeah it is about I was intrigued by the premise of this, which is basically that it's a deeply patriarchal society um, that they live in. This place is called uh, Oterra and it's basically a united kingdom. Um, so there has been some kind of tension or violence in the past and eventually all of these nations came together to form one nation and they have very patriarchal traditional orthodox kind of views about lots of things um the role of women is incredibly limited in this world and there are these girls called the alaki who essentially their blood runs gold um, when they reach maturity instead of red and they are considered impure and demonic and deeply kind of hated uh, and our main character Decca uh, turns out to be an alaki and it is, it is her story and it is really a kind of story of acceptance and finding your power and speaking um, on behalf of the downtrodden etc all very like all very good stuff for like a YA for a YA book but I did I just didn't love the execution of this I um I feel like the plot was really um it was really neat so like a problem would arise and within like two pages it was they'd found a solution for the problem so it just like f considering like what is actually happening in the book there was like not a lot of tension because it just felt like there were really convenient solutions to every kind of problem they encountered so you never really felt any kind of sense of trepidation or um real concern that that they weren't kind of gonna pull through it all and and be fine so yeah it was but having said that this is a YA book and and I am not a young 
adult. So like, I think it probably is incredibly enjoyable for its target audience. I am not the target audience for this book, so it's absolutely fine that I didn't, I didn't love it. Um, it just, yeah, not so much for me. Um, I did, I was really like forcing myself to like get through it a bit towards the end. But I think that is, I think that's probably quite unfair because I think that's probably more to do with like me wanting to get on to the next book that I'm going to read with like 24 hours of the readathon to go to see if I can get another one in. But, um, but yeah, it was fine. I'd have, I'd tell a lie actually, because I've, I've nearly read the entire Cunning Folk, um, Earth issue. And there was, there's been some, um, some great things in that. There's a lot on, um, death and grief and death positivity, which isn't something that I know a huge amount about, but the articles about that were really interesting. So that has been, um, that's been good to pepper in and amongst it. Um, I think I said in the last video that I'd DNF'd the, um, Celtic mythology audiobook that I'd tried. I just kind of wasn't getting on with it. And I, decided within about five minutes of listening to Tales from Old Japan that that also was <laughs> not for me. So I am listening to Stephen Fry's Troy, um, which if you have read his mythos or heroes, is very much in the same vein. I really enjoy, I was worried about Troy Overkill because the next book I'm about to read is, is also a Troy retelling. Um, but what I like about the Stephen Fry ones is that it kind of toys this line between fiction and non-fiction in that it's sort of like an episode of QI about Troy. So there's lots of kind of asides and there's lots of history in it. And we're kind of like jumping around and there's lots of direct address to the reader and he's kind of like, don't worry, you don't need to remember all these names and... And I'm uh, I'm enjoying it on audio. Um, I always really like uh, a Stephen Fry narration. I am enjoying that, and um, yeah, I'm about to start Moon Riders. So this was this is going to be a reread. I don't think I've read this book in nearly two decades, but it was my favourite book when I was about 13. I can't remember it like super clearly. I can't remember any of the characters' names, but I think this might be about Penthesilia, who is the, um, oh God, is Penthesilia an Amazon or an Ethiopian? One of the tribes who came to Troy and tried to help um, on behalf of the Greeks. Um, no, on behalf of the Trojans, uh, because Penthesilea was killed by Achilles. It also might not be her, but it's definitely about some badass, some more badass women. We're just, we're just doing like warrior things, but I'm a bit like, <laughs> I'm a bit, I am a bit concerned because. I think the things I didn't like about this were its YA properties and I haven't read this since I was the target audience for it. So I hope it's as good as I remember. Oh, cause it's not, I've enjoyed myself this week, but it has not been like a, re a resounding success. I've DNF'd two audiobooks. I've read one book that I thought was fine and one book that I thought was good but overall a little bit underwhelming and so I'm is this gonna save it or is this gonna be the nail in the coffin I really don't know but let's let's see I mean it's it's about 10 o'clock now Could probably read for about an hour or so tonight and then I can read all evening when I finish work tomorrow. And I might be able to just sneak it in. Let's try.
But I, I, I definitely think I'm not going to be getting to the Penelope ad or Jen Campbell's short stories. But I do think Jen, Jen's book was always a bit of a stretch for Legendathon, I think. Um, and yeah. I mean, I might just continue. I might just continue with Legendathon beyond the official limits because retellings are for always, not just for special weeks. But um, I will have to finish this video at some point. So, hey, let me read this and I'll get back to you. Bye. Just started reading literally on the author's note. It's the Amazons, guys. It's definitely the Amazons. It is Penthesil. Finished Moon Riders. It is 10 p.m. on Friday night. So I'm like in. Um did really enjoy it. Still processing. Gonna come to you tomorrow with like an actual wrap-up. But uh yeah, I did I did enjoy it. Do I think a big chunk of my enjoyment was nostalgia vibes? Probably. But I'll talk to you more about it tomorrow. Sweet. Bye. Hello. It is the end of Legendathon, so I am going to be wrapping up very quickly uh, the final couple of things that I read and um, having a quick look at the prompts that Jean put up because I actually think I might have covered them even though I have only read four, five including Cunning Folk. Um, five books of the original eight, I think, that I wanted to get to. Um, so first things first, let's chat Moonriders. So I think I filmed a little, a little clip yesterday when I finished it. And I really did enjoy it a lot, but I am struggling to separate my nostalgic enjoyment of going back to a book that I loved as a child versus... I, am I on the wonk? I think I am a bit. Hang on. Um, uh, yeah, so I think I, I, I don't know how rational I'm being basically about, about my enjoyment of it, but let me tell you about the book, um, because I did really enjoy it. I think it was the one that I enjoyed overall the most, but there's a big amount of nostalgia that will definitely be influencing that. But it is, um, it is a retelling set in and around the Trojan War, much like a lot of the things that I have read um, this week. But it follows, the main character is a young girl called um, Marina. And Marina is a member of the Mazagadi tribe who are a nomadic tribe in and around Troy, Greece. Uh, they're nomadic, so they traveled around. Um, and they get sort of embroiled in the the Trojan War conflict so it is really interesting to kind of see those events unfolding from the perspective of people and tribes who basically just kind of got caught up in um in the warfare that was going on so Marina when we first meet her is 13 and she has been selected by her tribe to go and join the Moonriders. So that is what the, the book is based on. The Moonriders is another name for Amazons. Um, not anything to do with the Amazon River. The Amazons um, were from, it says in the book, the coast of the Black Sea. Now, as someone with Ukrainian heritage, I am choosing to believe that they were from the Ukrainian coast of the Black Sea. I don't know if they actually were, but in my head, they are Ukrainian. Um, <laughs> but um, that's originally where they, where the tribe were from, and it was an all female, an all female band of warrior priestesses. So essentially, they are, they are priestesses to Ma, who's sort of um, a Mother Earth type character. So what's also interesting about this retelling is that the main characters do not believe in the Greek pantheon of, of gods. That's not their belief system. It's not their religion. They believe in Earth Mother Ma. Um, and so the parts of the story that tend to be the result of divine intervention in the Trojan War, um, for example, you know, Achilles 
having been dipped in the river Styx and that's why he's impenetrable, etc., is Teresa Tomlinson finds kind of other ways of explaining what... Blah, other ways of explaining um, why those why those things happened. Um, and, yeah, so Marina goes off to join the Moonriders, the Amazons, and so Penthesilea or Penthesilea? I'm never sure on the correct correct pronunciation of her name. I'm not sure on much. I've got a hair in my mouth. Hang on. Bloody hell. Um, <laughs> so she, uh, she is part of this tribe as well. So Marina goes off and joins them and then essentially gets embroiled in um, the Siege of Troy because the Amazons want to help the Trojans. Um, because they think the Greeks are basically just using Helen as an excuse to come and plunder the lands um, and kind of get the riches from the area and grab some land from the people who live there. Um, and that they, they believe that that is the real reason that they're there, not because they're trying to get Helen back. And um, and so they try and help the help the Trojans. I do think it it does play a bit fast and loose with um, the canon. But I kind of, I'm I'm okay with that because we, do, we don't really know what happened anyway. <laughs> so um, I do think there is an element to, uh, particularly in terms of the resolution for some characters. She doesn't go so far as to like um, have Penthesilea survive, um, but there are some characters who I'm pretty sure tend to have um, slightly worse outcomes. Um, and she does, there is a bit of authorial wish fulfillment going on there, I think. But I, I found that overall the book was really, really enjoyable. And I hadn't realised that it was the first in a series. Maybe, maybe I think there is only one more book. Um, so I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna treat myself to that because, yeah, I just had a, I had a really, <laughs> um, excuse me, <coughs> a really lovely time reading it. Um, and yeah. Like, I would, I would be very interested for the perspective of someone who has read it without the nostalgia attachment to it, but I really liked it, so there we go. Um, I also finished reading um, Cunning Folk, uh, so I finished reading that anthology. Overall, I did, I really, really enjoyed it. It did lean, I, it felt like it lent more to the occult than the myth and legend vibe um which i don't which i don't mind but i it it didn't feel like a vet it was less myth folklore than i was expecting i think um but i appreciate also that like those things are super enmeshed so um so there was that um i also want to do a quick update on the gilded ones because i think i said before that i was going to research um whether or not the book was based on a specific West African mythology and it wasn't but um what I have found out is that Namana Fauna basically was um inspired by various strong women from African myths and legends including I think and I wrote them down one sec um the Dahomey Amazons um so different to the um Black Sea Amazons that uh, are in the Moonriders and um, Mami Wata, who I think is a, a water, some kind of water goddess. Um, but also, um, Namina grew up in Sierra Leone during the, the big conflict in Sierra Leone. And she also was told lots of kind of legend stories by her grandparents, I think, to kind of distract her from that. And I do think you can feel the echoes of that through through the Gilded Ones. So not a strict retelling, but very kind of inspired by characters from. Um, so there's that. And then the final thing um, is that I did read and finish just, I, sl I listened to the last hour today on sat in Saturday. So like, does that count? I'm just sneaking it in. Um, to Stephen Fry's Troy, which I, I really enjoyed. I'm unsurprised that I enjoyed it. I really enjoyed his, um, mythos and heroes and this is the kind of third installment of that they're um they're really good sort of anthologies of or kind of catalogues of of mythology i think because 
what they aren't is what the other things that I've read this this week are. They're not kind of a literary retelling of like a part of the myth um, where authors are having to kind of zoom in and kind of focus on one or two key characters or aspects. It's really encyclopedic and broad, which I really um, which I really like. Um, and I think it is a great if you're like less familiar with. Um, Greek mythology, though they're really, really good accessible series, um, and I, I really recommend them. He doesn't, um, he doesn't tend to have like a, uh, you know, like um, what is the word that I mean, like a, uh, an agenda as as a writer about this. Although he did seem very down on Paris, which I completely understand. I am not pro Paris. But um, he seemed very, very committed in his in his version to the idea that Helen was not happy um, being in Troy with Paris, which um, felt like kind of a real choice, given that the rest of the book didn't really seem like he was making those kind of choices. But, you know, Paris is a little bitch, so I'm here for it. Um, I also really enjoyed, at the end of the audiobook, I don't know if it's in the hard copy... Um, but there were a couple of appendices, um, which kind of look at how much, like what we currently know about how much of Troy was historical fact, if indeed any of it was, and how much is kind of myth or legend, because most of our understanding of the story of the siege of Troy comes from Homer and Homer wrote the Iliad, um, about a thousand years after the events of Troy would have happened. So um, there was a lot of ambiguity about whether or not these things really happened. And that was really, really interesting. And also this idea of, um, it was interesting listening to that after Moon Riders because I, I was reading, as I was reading Moon Riders, I was a bit like, oh, I don't know how I feel about her playing kind of fast and loose with the with the canon in some bits and being like because Cassandra goes and jo joins the Moon Riders and I'm like did Cassandra do that and then um because Cassandra hasn't done that in any version of the story that I've read and then Stephen Fry is basically saying we don't fucking know um so I'm like sure if Teresa Thompson wants to send Cassandra off with the Moon Riders to become a like warrior priestess cool I'm here for it I'm here for it but um so the prompts quickly before I but I'll put them up on the screen, but I've written them down here too. So, uh, the first one was read a novel, and I have read three novels. So, yay, that's that's those. Um, Tale from Another Country, um, I mean, technically, that none of them are from England. Um, but I think probably we'll stick uh, the Gilded Ones in there. A new to you author, that would also be Namna Fauna. Um, I've not read any of her work before. A format or genre that you don't typically read, that is what Cunning Folk was in there for. Um, I don't read a lot of uh, zines or kind of publications like that and it's definitely something that I want to read more of. Um, a tale that is retold less. I don't think we can have any of the Trojan stuff in there. Um, and I don't, I don't know if just the Gilded Ones, I don't think that would count because it's not a specific myth that doesn't get told. But I will say that you don't, I definitely, when I was specifically trying to, to look at my shelves or like come up with books that were available on like audio or something for mythologies from Africa, I really wasn't finding a lot of, <laughs> a lot of stuff easily. So I guess... There is a whole kind of like myth series that in Western publishing is maybe um, underexplored. So tangentially, I think I can I can do that one. Um, a queer retelling, The Song of Achilles. Uh, a recommendation from someone else. I was reminded that I hadn't read Troy by Stephen Fry by my friend Lula. So thank you, Lula. Um, read from more than one mythology. Just it was. Thank God for Namunafono, or this wouldn't have been Legendathon, it would have been like Trojanathon. Um, and the final one was Pick Your Prompt. And I think um, when I first heard uh, that Jean was going to do this, the one book that popped into my head was that I really wanted to find a copy of Moonriders and reread it because of how much I loved it when I was 
a kid. And so I think for Pick My Prompt, I am I'm going for a, a childhood a childhood favourite. Um so yeah. That has been Legendathon. It has been fun, if not like a wholly successful reading experience. I don't think I've like loved a lot of the stuff that I've read. Um but it has been really fun. Um and my brain my losing the plot brain has fo- kind of done surprisingly okay for having three different versions of Troy happening in my head this week. I'm very I'm very proud of brain for how how they've coped with that. So thanks Jean for like organizing this and uh, giving me an excuse to get to some of the titles on my shelf. And I will see you again soon for some more bookish stuff. If you have enjoyed this, please do like and subscribe. Um, And I will catch you later. And look at my lovely tree. She's called Meredith.